Uh, Pastor Darius talked about your Discover card. Can you take that out real quick? And on the back, can you just write down the, what it says on the screen here? Loving, one, two, three. Every week throughout this series, we are giving some application challenges uh, as we talk about these different arts of spiritual conversations. And so I have three for you today as well. And so we will uh, talk about that towards the end of the message. Now, if, uh, if you've been here, if you're here for the first time, let me kind of catch you up on what we're doing. We're t- talking about these arts of spiritual conversations because we want to be able to share with people in our lives the hope that we have received because Jesus has rescued us from our sin. He has get, enabled us to have new life in him. And we want to talk about it. We should be talking about it. It is the good news. And that's why the gospel, it's called the gospel, the, the good news. And we, should, we want to share the hope that we have. And so we recognize that sometimes the church can make sharing our faith or evangelism way more complicated than it needs to be. And sometimes we're nervous that we might do things uh, the wrong way. And could there really ever be a wrong way to share your faith? Well, I have discovered a few on my own through trial and error. But as I was thinking about this message and and preparing, I I was reminded that this last Friday was Halloween. And I grew up in a a church where if you participated in anything called Halloween, I mean, you were on a fast track to hell. I grew up afraid of things like this, that I was going to go to hell if I, if I trick-or-treated. So instead, we went to the harvest party, which was basically teaching kids how to gamble for candy. Anyway, um, I don't know which is worse, asking for it or gambling for it, whatever. Uh, but so one year, finally, my parents were, were like, okay, fine, you can go trick-or-treating with your friends. And so I got my pillowcase, and I'm nine years old, and I go, start going door-to-door. And uh, I remember one house... Uh, started, gave out these things called Chick Tracts. Do you know what a Chick Tract is? It's a little comic book to help you uh, meet Jesus. I love comic books, so I read it. Now, this comic book basically was telling me what I had been growing up believing, that if you participate in tr- trick-or-treating and Halloween festivities, you're going to hell. And, and so it was a very fear-based motive for evangelism. It wasn't very loving at all. It was all fear. Now, the motive, like their their hope is that, you know, this kid is coming to the door and they're going to read this thing and they're going to maybe talk to their parents about it. And they're like, you know what? We should all go to church. Let's find out what, let's find out more. But more often than not, those chick tracks just got thrown away. There's a great comedian who uh, said, you know, handing out flyers is like telling somebody, here, you throw this away for me. And (laughs) that's basically what that happened. Like, we read it, and like, okay, well, I'm already going to church. <laughs> See ya. Um, it wasn't a loving thing. And as we look at these arts of spiritual conversations, we have talked about noticing the people around us and beginning to pray for them. We've talked about listening to them and asking meaningful questions. And through this process, our hope is that we are learning how to love them well. And so today, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about loving. And why do we need to love? Love is a big thing throughout the Bible. It is very important. And one of the things that we need to remember is that, first of all, we are called to love God. In the Old Testament, and you can follow along on the app. The notes are all in there. The texts are all in there. But it's also going to be on the screen. But you can write those down uh, as we go through on that note sheet in the program. But we're called to love God. In the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is giving his final teaching to the people of Israel. They are about to enter into the land that God had promised them, but Moses knows that he is not going to go with them. And so he is giving his his last teaching to the people. And one of the key things that he says is in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This verse became so important to the people of Israel that they would say it every day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It was to be ingrained in their life, that idea. Now, why were they supposed to love the Lord with all that they were and everything they have? 
because God had first shown his love to the people of Israel because he, they, he, they were enslaved in Egypt and they cried out to God and God heard their cries and rescued them and brought them out of Egypt and is leading them to the land of promise. And so they recognize God's work in their lives. And so loving the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, this should be easy for them. But over and over again, if you read through the Old Testament, it became a difficult thing for them to do, to love the Lord their, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But today, for followers of Jesus, this verse is still a great verse for us to remember that we should love the Lord our God with all that we are. Everything we have, we need to love the Lord. And the love of God in us is because God first loved us, but that love should show the world around us that we are marked by that love of Christ. And later in, in the New Testament time, uh, John wrote a letter to a church. And, and so in 1 John chapter 4, uh, John was a disciple and a friend of Jesus, and he's writing this to, the, to a church to encourage them to live in love. And so let's look at 1 John 4, 9, 9 through 19. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as, a, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how we how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. God showed Israel his love by rescuing them from slavery in Egypt. God shows us his love by sending Jesus to die for us, as 1 John tells us, as an atoning sacrifice for our sin, to rescue us from the slavery of our sin. And you might be thinking, wait, Jason, Jason, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not, I'm not a sinner. I'm a good person. Our default position of our hearts is towards selfishness towards our own pride, towards our own ego, towards all of these things. And if we follow that default position, it will lead us away from God. Because we'll do things for ourselves without thinking of other people. We'll be sinning against others. And it doesn't really matter if you are a good person. As long as your default position is set towards sin, you are still on that path. But Jesus came. Because God loved us, he sent Jesus to rescue us from our sin. And he paid the price for all of our sin, past, present, future sin. Jesus has paid that price. We need to accept that gift that Jesus has made available for us. And when we accept what Jesus has done, he changes through the power of the Spirit the position of our hearts. So no longer are we oriented towards our own selfishness and our pride and our ego and our own desires. Jesus begins to transform us so that we become more and more like him. Marked by his love, by his grace, the grace and love that we have already received. So as we look at this text, we, our first point is that we, we first are called to love God because he first loved us. And then the second thing is Christians are called to love one another. So John is writing to this church to remind them to be a loving community, to be marked by the love of Christ in us and through us. The church should be dramatically known for love. 
And it should be a contrast between the world and the church. Because you go out in the world and you, you expect people to hurt you. You expect people to lie to you. You expect people to cheat you. You expect people to, to do all kinds of things, to offend you, to try to get their own desires because their sinful hearts are set towards sin. So there is a contrast. The church should be marked by love, where we learn how to love one another and to submit to one another. And if we love one another, we show the world that we live in God. Now, this is an ongoing process because I'm fairly sure that there are people in this room who have been hurt by Christians before who maybe you've been a part of a church and you've been spiritually wounded. First of all, I'm sorry. I can't fix what happened before, but I can grieve with you because the church should be a place where that is marked by love, but so often we find that there are still sinful people here, right? Because guess what? You're here and I'm here. We still struggle with sin. We are not yet perfect, and we're going to mess up, and we're going to offend people, and we're going to have to work through this. But as we follow Jesus, our hope is that we would become more and more loving, not more and more selfish, and more and more sinful, but that we would begin to become more like Jesus, marked by love, so that people would see in the church the love of Christ. And in the church is the place where we learn how to love sinful people. Because I, like I told you, I will probably offend you. I will probably do something that, that upsets you. And my, here's my hope. If I do that, will you talk to me? This is one of the ways that we learn how to love one another. Go to the person who offended you. Tell them what's going on. Seek, to, seek forgiveness. Seek grace. Seek reconciliation. This is all part of learning how to love one another. And if you've been wounded before, I mean, this is one of the, the great things about Creekside is we want to help you to give your pain to Jesus, to trust Jesus with that. I, I wish I could say you would never be hurt again, but you will. Love is something that, that you know. You go into love knowing that you will be hurt. And a, and a relationship that is worth it, you know there will be time where there might be conflict. There might be some time where you're gonna butt heads a little bit but it's worth it to work through those things because you love one another. And the church is where we learn how to love sinful, broken people. So if you're thinking like, oh man, well, if the church is full of sinful, broken people, then I'm just gonna go to another church where maybe I won't find any of them. And there's laughter because you know, guess what? You're gonna find some there too. And you know why? Because you're there. Because all of your problems are not going to be solved by going someplace else. Because who's the common denominator to all of your drama? You, me. And if I'm just going to try to run away from, from past hurts and from pain to find a loving community where people aren't going to hurt me, then guess what? I'm the biggest offender in that because I didn't go back and get reconciliation from the people who I might have hurt and the people who hurt me. Wherever we go, we take that with us. And here's the thing, at Creekside, we wanna help you give those to Jesus. Not just to hold on to them and rehearse them and say, you know what, people hurt me before. I'm not gonna jump into ministry. I'm not gonna serve. I'm just gonna hang out here because I've been hurt before. And I, I, I implore you to don't hold on to those hurts. Let them go. Trust Jesus with those and say, you know what, Jesus, I know that I'm gonna be with other people who are just like me and are sinful and they need you and I need you, so help me to engage with them, with you. Jesus, help me to learn to love like you loved me. The church is a great place to learn how to love sinful people because we learn here, we use our gifts here, we join ministry teams here to learn how to serve and love other people. We get in community groups here because we learn how to love and, sin, uh, love and serve sinful people. <laughs> Wait a minute. We, we need to learn these things here because when we go into the world, guess what's out there? People like us 
who are sinful and hurting and they need Jesus. And we carry the love of Jesus everywhere we go. Not that we have arrived, but that we are in process of becoming more and more like Jesus. Next week, we're gonna talk about welcoming. We're gonna talk about how we learn how to do that. Again, we learn to be welcoming here so that we can learn how to be welcoming out there to help people feel comfortable as we talk with them about the hope that we have in Jesus. We will mess up. We will struggle. We will learn how to do this together. But the church is where we learn how to love sinful and broken people. The church is a great place to learn. So Jesus is, the word has told us that we are called to love God. We're called to love one another. And then Jesus in the gospel of Matthew will remind us that we are called to love our neighbors. So uh, in Matthew 22, Jesus is talking to religious leaders and they're trying to trip him up and get him to say something that will help uh, them to build a case against Jesus because he's building these crowds of followers and the religious leaders are, are concerned that these crowds that Jesus is building will turn against them and maybe even turn against Rome and cause more problems in their region as they're fighting against this, this uh, oppressive regime. And so they're like, they're trying to set Jesus up as a revolutionary to say, should we pay taxes? And Jesus is like, give to God what is God's. And they're like, oh man, he got us. And Jesus is constantly hearing their questions and returning their questions to say the, the problem is your own heart. The religious people, their hearts are so twisted to try to do everything right and to get everything perfect that they're not really learning how to love people. And so they ask in Matthew 22, verse 34. Let's pick up there. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Does that sound familiar? It's the Shema. Jesus knows. Jesus knows that this is super important. So he responds, the first is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. There are 613 laws in the Old Testament. I didn't count this week, I looked it up. (laughs) What this man's question for Jesus is, is which of these 613 should I really focus on? And he is trying to get Jesus to say what's really important, and then maybe he built a case to say all these other things Jesus is saying are not important. Jesus doesn't take the word of God seriously. He's discounting all of these things. Jesus is hip to this trick, man. He's not gonna fall for it. And so he tells him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they're like, oh man, he got us. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if we look at the law, if you read through the law, what is it talking about over and over again? How to honor God with everything you are, with all that you have, and how to care and love your neighbor. Care for and love your neighbor. As an example, there is a law in the Old Testament that says when you build your houses, put a rail around the roof. Now, In our American society, we would say, yeah, you put a rail around your roof so that people, when they fall off, they don't sue you. (laughs) But that's not the point. The point of this law is you put a rail around your roof because you're hanging out up there in the evening and you're fellowshipping up there and you love your neighbor enough that you don't want them to fall off your roof. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the law is telling the people of Israel to do. And when we look at the law as Christians, that's what we should be looking for as well. How does this law help me to love God and love people? But then he says all, so Jesus says all the law and the prophets hang on these two verses. What are the prophets constantly telling the people of Israel? Turn back to loving God with all you have and all you are and how to, and come back to loving people. Treat the poor, the widow, the oppressed among you well with the love of God. Throughout the Old Testament, they, they, they are constantly imploring the people of Israel to love God with everything they have and all that they are 
and love their neighbor as themselves. Jesus has just summed up all of the Old Testament for you. And if we're reading through the Old Testament without those filters, we're missing the point altogether. This is to help us love God with everything we have and love our neighbor as ourselves. It is so important to Jesus. These two things that when asked, he said, these are the most important things. But what keeps us from doing that? Because we're not really great, right, as a people, at loving people, like our neighbors. Like I had this, this neighbor who lived behind my house, in a house, not just like in the woods behind my house. He was in a house, and he was a drummer. And he decided that on Saturdays from noon to 10 p.m. that he was going to get wasted and play the drums super loud. I had a hard time loving my neighbor. I got super angry because my son, Judah, we had just, he had just been born. And you know what is the most important thing to a young parent with a young baby? Sweet. Nap time! It's the best! Because everybody's napping. And my neighbor got wasted, cranked the music, and drummed along to the music every single weekend. And Jesus challenged me to love my neighbor. Not just to be mad at my neighbor, not just to like pray against or at my neighbor, but to actually love my neighbor. And so one day, when this was happening, went over to my neighbor's house, introduced myself, say, hey, hey man, I've got this young kid. He's trying to nap. You're making it really difficult for our family. Can, is, what can we do to make this possible? And he started to explain to me. That's, this is why I know he got wasted and drummed all day, because he told me. This is the only day I can, man. I was like, well, why do you want to do that? And we talked, and we began to build a relationship. But that was the loving thing to do, was to go and talk to him. To not just be angry at him, but to talk to him. What keeps us from doing that? There's a lot of things that keep us from loving our neighbor. Not understanding how much God loves them. Not understanding how much God loves us. Some other things that might keep us from talking to them and loving them is fear. I had a fear that my neighbor might punch me in the face. I had to overcome that fear. I've been punched in the face one time. I don't want to do it again. Insecurity. Our own pride. Our anger. Our past hurts. Trust issues. Cultural barriers. These are all things that keep us from actually loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. But is it worth it to overcome these things if by loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, we might be able to help them find the love of Jesus? Is it worth it? The correct answer is yes. So if anybody thought no, let me just help you. The correct answer is yes, because Jesus loved you enough to die for you. So anything he wants you to do to love somebody else, it's worth it. It's worth it. And we need to seek Jesus in these moments and not just to be angry or, or frustrated with our neighbor, but to actually love them. It might be, maybe you have great neighbors, but maybe it's like, you know what? I see them out uh, raking up their leaves right now. And you grab your rake and you join them. And when they ask, why are you doing this? You say, well, you know what? I just wanted to share the love of Jesus. I saw you out here, you're a good neighbor and I love you and I wanna just serve you. It might be that there's somebody in your, in your workplace or at work that you just say, you know what, why don't you come to lunch with me? Because they're super lonely and you can help them to know that they're not alone, that they are loved, that they are valuable. Maybe it's just taking a moment to write an encouraging note to somebody. To say, hey man, I see what you're going through and I love you and I want you to know that you're not alone and if I can help you in any way, please let me know. All of these things have action tied to them. We're not just trying to love people by saying, yeah, I love my neighbor. We actually have to do something with it because love requires action. So how will we love our neighbor? How will we show people in this world that we truly love them? Can you take out your Discover card? I told you that I would give you three application points this week. And uh, the first application point, I'm, as we go through this, if you're like, yeah, I can do that, just circle these numbers, one, two, three. And we will be praying with you this week as we 
go over these cards in our staff meeting and be praying that Jesus would help us to become more loving. All right, the first one is bless people in the crowd. Maybe you take the bus to, to work or you, before you go into work, you spend some time at a coffee shop and just kind of gather your, your day and get ready for the day. Or maybe you're at the gym and you're working out and there's tons of people there. There's, instead of just looking at all these people and say, wow, what did they do with their hair today? What's going on with them? Like, like what if you actually took some time to, to bless them? Not out loud, just silently in your own heart. Just say, Jesus, I pray that you would help them have an amazing day at work. Jesus, I pray for that single mom who just brought like eight kids into Starbucks and, and they're ru- hustling, wrestling all through the, 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 the day and trying to get this all organized. Lord, Jesus, I pray that you just give her peace. Help her. Help her. And start to just bless people that you see throughout the day. Maybe you want to take a moment and just write down these things. Like these are the people I prayed for and so that you can come back to it and be praying for them throughout the week. To be praying for them and blessing them. I want to encourage you as well, just reflect on what is this doing in your own heart towards them, towards people that you might not even know that well at all. Because our hope is not that we're just putting out cosmic vibes to the universe. Our hope is that it changes our hearts so that we can become more loving. Because we want to love people the way Jesus loved us. And so it starts by just actually loving them and, and, and caring for them. So if that's you if, you, if you're gonna bless people in the crowd, can you just circle number one? Number two is encourage one person this week. One person. Can you handle it? One person. And maybe it is, a, 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 if you see somebody at work doing something good and doing well, and you say, hey man, that's awesome. I'm so proud of you. And encouraging them. Or maybe it's somebody that you know is struggling and going through a hard time and you take the time to write them a letter. And, and even mail it to them or email it to them. Somehow communicate to them like, I am praying for you and I love you. How can I help you? How can I show the love that I have for you? And when they ask you why you're doing this, don't just say, well, I just thought it'd be a good idea. No, I, I'm gonna dare you. I'm double dog daring every single one of you. If you circle number two, if they say, why are you doing this? It says, because Jesus loves you. And I wanted to show you that love. That's gonna open up some conversations. And it's good. All right? So if that's you today, if you're, if you're saying, I'm going to encourage one person this week, circle number two. And the last one is to uh, memorize 1 John 4.10, which says this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Why are we memorizing Scripture because we want to keep the word of God in our hearts and in our minds. I recognize that I know more radio jingles than, than scripture, and I'm sure you do too. Let's test it. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Exactly. I'm with you, Michael. Michael was brave enough to actually say it, but you all knew it, and you're all thinking, mm, French fries. What if instead of like that Pavlovian response for French fries, we hide the word of God in our heart and we start saying, you know, I'm gonna love people because Jesus first loved me. Jesus loved me enough to die for me, so I should love my neighbor. What if? So today, if, you, if that's you, if you're saying, I want to uh, memorize scripture, then can you circle number three and we're gonna be praying with you. We've been looking at Ephesians 6.18, uh, uh, James 1.19, and now uh, 1 John 4.10. Let's work on this. Let's hide the word of God in our heart so that we might not sin against God and that we might remember his promises. Maybe you're with us today and you're, you're not following Jesus yet. I've talked a lot about how much Jesus loves you, that he died for you, that he wants to change the default position of your heart from sin to become more and more like Jesus. And today, if you're saying, you know what, I, I, I'm tired of doing life alone. I'm tired of, of feeling like nobody cares about me. I'm tired of just always wanting my own desires. I'm ready for something different. If that's you today, can you mark become a follower of Jesus on your Discover card? Because we want to encourage you. We want to celebrate with you. We want to help give you some next steps on that journey. But it starts when we recognize that I just need to receive the grace that Jesus has made available for me. And if that's you, can you mark on your card? And maybe you need to take the next step of getting baptized. And in a little bit, Pastor Darius is going to be up here talking about baptism. And, and he would love to help you get baptized next week. We don't have to put it off. We don't have to wait till your third uncle's in town so he can celebrate with you. Let's get baptized. Let's celebrate 
what Jesus is doing in your life, as how he's rescuing us and rescuing you. Can you all hold your cards as we pray together? Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for coming to rescue us from our sin, from our selfishness, from our, our own pride. Jesus, help us to be more loving. And I ask as we are looking at these commitments about blessing people in the crowd, about encouraging somebody, about memorizing scripture, Lord, I pray that you would give us strength to do this, courage to have these conversations with people, and that we would be motivated not just to do good Christian things, but because we want to love people the way you loved us. So Jesus, I pray that you would help us. And for those who are saying yes to you for the first time, Jesus, I ask that you would reveal that you have loved them all the way here, that you have been wanting them to know your love, and now they can. So I just pray that your spirit would just fill them with a, a sense of your incredible love, and I pray that Creekside would be able to come alongside them and help them to grow, to become more and more like Jesus. So help us, and we do this all for your glory. Amen.